in the month of Kislev, between mid-December 598 and mid-January 597 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar's army marched again to Hatiland. The description in the Babylonian Chronicle focused on the main target of this campaign, the conquest of the city of Judah, Uru Yehudu, namely Jerusalem. He besieged the city of Judah, and on the second day of the month of Adar, he seized the city and captured the king. He appointed there a king of his own choice, received its heavy tribute, and sent them to Babylon. The date when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, the second day of Adar, is March 15th or 16th, 597 BCE. Who is the king that, according to the Babylonian chronicle, was captured? Who is the king that was appointed according to the Babylonian decision? The king that revolted against the Babylonians was Jehoiakim. The basis for the revolt was his reliance on Egyptian support. He probably expected the Egyptians to do battle with Babylon, but it is probable that Judah was not alone. The ultimate fate of Gaza, which had been defeated two years previously by the Egyptians, is unclear. It is also not clear if Ekron was defeated and laid waste at this stage. The campaign in the winter and spring of 598 and 597 BCE was a continuation of a campaign of the previous year in which the Babylonian goal was to establish its rule in the southern part of Hatuland. This provides the background for understanding the biblical description in 2nd Book of Kings, chapter 24, verse 2, on the delegation of auxiliary forces. Vayeshalach Adonai bo et gdudei kasdim, vet gdudei aram, vet gdudei moav, vet gdudei bnei amon, vayeshalcham bi Yehuda lehaavido, ki dvar Adonai asher diber beyad avadav anevi'im. Historiographically, the sending of these bands was Jehoiakim's punishment, according to the biblical historiographer, as a successor of King Menasseh and the sinner among the last four kings of Judah. N nonetheless, in terms of the historical reconstruction, it is likely that the campaign of the bands preceded the arrival of the Babylonian army and forced some of the residents of Judah to flee the border areas and enter to Jerusalem. This is the background for the story preserved in Jeremiah 35, where, in verse 11, the group of the Rechabites are telling to Jeremiah, Vayehi be'alot nevuchadretzar melech bavel el ha'aretz, v'nomer, bo'u v'navo Yerushalayim ipnei chel kakasdim u'ipnei chel aram v'neshev b'Yerushalayim. Only at a later stage did the main Babylonian force arrive in Judah, perhaps with the intention of accepting the king's capitulation. This is how we should understand 2nd Book of Kings 24, verse 10 and 11. Ba'et ahi, alu avdei Nebuchadnezzar melech bavel Yerushalayim, v'tavo ha'ir b'matzor. V'yavo Nebuchadnezzar melech bavel al ha'ir v'avadav, the biblical description indicates that from the beginning of the campaign against Jerusalem at some stage in the month of Kislev until the capitulation of the city on the seconds of the month of Adar, no more than three months had elapsed. Thus, it's clear that the Babylonian campaign was intended from the very beginning to suppress Jehoiakim's revolt. The king was still alive when the Babylonians planned the campaign and he died either close to the beginning of it or after the, the Babylonian force had departed from Babylon. How do we know? Because his son, the crown prince, who became a king after him, ruled according to the second book of Kings, chapter 24, verse 8, exactly three months. 
בן 18 שנה יהויכין במלכו, ושלושה חודשים מלך בירושלים. If he is the king who was exiled by the Babylonians at the second day of Adar, so he started to rule no later than early Kislev, exactly when Nebuchadnezzar left Babylon on his way to Judah. There are several scenarios of Jehoiakim's death, since his death saved Judah from destruction and led the kingdom 11 more years of existence. Can it be that it, he was murdered? Some scholars interpreted some of Jeremiah's curses against the king as a proof for his unnatural death. In chapter 36, verse 30, Jeremiah is cursing the king and saying, לכן כה אמר אדוני על יהויקים מלך יהודה, לא יהיה לו יושב על כיסא דוד, ונבלתו תהיה מושלכת לחורב ביום ולקרח בלילה. I like this verse very much, since Jeremiah definitely wrong, since Jehoiakim's son sat on the throne after him, even if only for three months. If Jeremiah was wrong in this, why to think that he was not wrong concerning the death of the king? The same is true concerning the curse of the prophet toward the king in chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. לכן כה אמר אדוני אל יהויקים בן יאשיהו מלך יהודה, לא יספדו לו הוי אחי והוי אחות, לא יספדו לו הוי אדון והוי הודו, כבורת חמור יקבר, סחוב והשלך מהלאה לשערי ירושלים. In my opinion, even if something unnatural happened to Jehoiakim, he committed suicide in order to save Jerusalem, or was murdered from that reason. It was unknown to the people in Jerusalem and also to the biblical historiographer. He described his death in the second book of Kings, chapter 24, verse 6, as a natural one. In my opinion, Jehoiakim's death was not accompanied by any unusual circumstances. He died after a reign of 11 years, and was buried in Jerusalem precisely on the eve of the Babylonian campaign. In any case, his death saved the city from immediate devastation and gave the small kingdom another 11 years of existence. Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiachin, ascended the throne in his father's place. According to the description in the second book of King, chapter 24, verse 12, his first and only act as a king of Judah was to surrender to the Babylonians. Vayetze Yehoyachin Melech Yehuda al Melech Babel, Hu veimo veavadav vesarav vesarisav. Since it was not Jehoyachin who revolted, it's clear why the Babylonians didn't lay waste onto Jerusalem, allowing Judah to remain as a subjugated kingdom for, with the Davidic house on the throne. The Babylonians didn't destroy Jerusalem, but for the first time since resting control of Hatuland, they actively interfered in the governing arrangements in Jerusalem, deported many of its residents, and took much plunder. It is probable that the Babylonians' intent was to stabilize the rule in Judah, and from their point of view, these were the op optimal arrangements for securing that goal. The Babylonian arrangement in Judah after the surrender of Jerusalem in March 597 BCE will be at the focus of the next unit. For the first time, a king was deported together with some of the elite and the Davidic family. Also the prophet Ezekiel, was among these exiled elite. For the first time, Judahites lived in two remote areas. According to Jeremiah 24, the better part of Judah was the one who was deported to Babylon. Jeremiah 24. <laughs> אחרי הגלות נבוכדרצר מלך בבלת יחניהו בן יהויקים מלך יהודה 
ואת שרי יהודה, ואת החרש ואת המסגר מירושלים, ויביאם בבל. הדוד האחד תאנים טובות מאוד, והדוד אחד תאנים רעות מאוד, אשר לא תאכל לה מרוע. ויהי דבר אדוני אלי לאמור, כה אמר אדוני אלוהי ישראל, כתאנים הטובות האלה כן אכיר את גלות יהודה, אשר שילחתי מן המקום הזה ארץ כסדים לטובה. וכתאנים הרעות אשר לא תאכלנה מרוע, כי כה אמר אדוני, כן אתן את צדקיהו מלך יהודה ואת שרה ואת שארית ירושלים, הנשארים בארץ הזאת והיושבים בארץ מצרים. Who wrote it? When? Why? What point of view these verses are reflecting? This is part of the theological debate that we will also deal with in one of the next weeks, but it reflects the historical reality that we just described, and we will develop it in the next unit of this course. Music